we now have essentially the most stable, most reliable uh, perovskites that exist. And, uh, and so then if you put that perovskite material on top of silicon, you can have a very cost-effective tenon. And uh, the exciting thing about perovskites is that it's relatively easy to tune the band gap. And so uh, you can make a high band gap material that's an excellent match of, uh, to the uh, lower band gap of silicon and then in, you know, get a much higher efficiency panel. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by Continental Energy Solutions. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. Today on the Clean Power Hour, do engineers dream of solar panel efficiency? We're going to find out. Welcome to the show, my co-host and commercial solar guy, John Weaver. Hey, Tim. I hope everything's doing all right in the Midwest in this uh, nice, warm summer. Uh, I appreciate the work. Sorry, you were about to tell us how beautiful the sunlight is out there on your projects. It's a it's a thunderstormy day here in central Illinois. I'm back from Nashville, so it's not nearly as fun as Nashville was, but life is good. Okay, so and you got a free solar panel cleaning. Exactly. <laughs> Except I don't have solar panels anymore because I sold my microgrid on wheels. But I they're in my garage. I, I have my next wave of solar panels for my uh, high-tech camper, camper trailer. But we're not going to talk about that today. What are we going to talk about, John? Today, we're going to talk about tandem solar cells and perovskite, one of my favorite topics. And we have with us um, the CEO of a new company, Cubic PV, that is a combination of two older companies. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk with Frank from Boston, who likes talking about solar panels. So, uh, oh, by the way, Frank went to MIT, and uh, so I think that means he's smart. We don't have any evidence of that yet, but hopefully in the next hour, we're going we're gonna to work through these details. So Frank, um, <clears throat> nice to meet you. Yeah, that, that evidence might, be, uh, might not be forthcoming, but uh, I know a lot of smart people. Uh, Perfect. I got that out of that particular degree. Uh, and they all helped me graduate. So in, in that sense, <laughs> in that sense, it was a pleasurable experience. So, I mean, really, we're, you know, Tim, T Tim and I, we're both developers. I write for PV Magazine, and we're all, every week, Tim has to deal with me talking about the latest, greatest, warm and fuzzy technology. Tim tries to focus on things that exist in the real world, projects, you know, rockets being launched in the space. But, you know, tandem solar cells are really, in my opinion, and yours as well, because I have it on record, Frank, that it's gonna take over the in industry. And you guys are now seemingly moving toward a new factory in India, two gigs, and you're developing products that are, I don't know, about 45 minutes away from me, Northwest, I think. And uh, I'm really interested in you know, what you guys are gonna to bring to the market. And I guess, I mean, if you just, for our, for our listeners, our readers, our watchers, um, if you would just tell them the key thing that you plan on giving us all, um, that might be a great start just to figure it out. Yeah, so the idea of a multi-junction solar cell, meaning a, a, a solar cell that has different semiconductors to process the light more efficiently, that has existed for a long time because that's the way satellites are being powered. Mm -hmm. but the issue is satellites is that those cells produce 50% more power and they are a thousand times more expensive. And so clearly in a terrestrial uh, application, you know, you get 50% more energy, you have to pay a thousand times more, that doesn't work. And so the hope has always been, can you do this in a cost-effective manner? So you get that extra energy boost and, uh, and don't have to pay a fortune. And the exciting thing is that those terrestrial solutions, and you're right, they don't exist yet, but the exciting thing is that those terrestrial solutions are now becoming a reality. And, uh, and they will become a reality much faster than people think. And so the, the basic concept here is that today in a solar panel, the dominant semiconductor material is silicon. And uh, silicon is good at processing uh, photons of 1.1 EV energy. Uh, that's the band gap of silicon. And so all photons that have less energy than that, they go to waste because they don't have enough energy to lift the electron across the band gap. All photons that have more energy than the band gap of silicon, 
Well, that extra energy is wasted as well because you're only going to get one electron for one photon. And so uh, the best you can do is to get a solar panel of roughly 20, 22, maybe 24% efficiency, but that's really your physical limit. You just can't do any better than that. In other words, more than 75% of the available energy is not used. And that, of course, is a tragedy. And so the, the, the exciting thing about Tandem is that you use multiple solar, multiple semiconductors. And so now you can increase the energy harvest per acre and deliver more energy to the user in, uh, you know, with the same form factor. And, uh, and, and that's, that's something we've been working on for a long time. And it's now really, we now have all the pieces we need to make this a commercial reality. So multi-junction tandem solar cell is fundamentally what we're delivering. But the tandem piece, the second piece of the tandem is really the headline grabber these days because perovskites, perovskites, perovskites. Um, have you heard that word a couple of times said out loud repeatedly? And, you know, and Tim has, Tim has to hear me say it almost every single week. Um, how are you guys working with this? Like, I mean, actually, I guess this is part of your combination that you just made. I mean, you just created a new company based on this logic. Yeah, so we're, we're lucky. Uh, so um, the uh, Hunt Energy started this effort uh, eight years ago. They had a fundamental sort of chemistry effort aimed at improving the perovskite material and making it stable. And uh, they, they started off hiring an entrepreneur in residence, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Michael Irwin. And he, uh, I mean, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And he put together a very capable team. And together, they solved some of the fundamental chemistry problems. And so uh, we now have essentially the most stable, most reliable uh, perovskites that exist. And, uh, and so then if you put that perovskite material on top of silicon, you can have a very cost-effective tandem. And uh, the exciting thing about perovskites is that it's relatively easy to tune the band gap. And so uh, you can make a high band gap material that's an excellent match of, uh, to the uh, lower band gap of silicon and then in, you know, get a much higher efficiency panel. And that, uh, that is what we are, uh, are putting together. So Frank, tell our listeners about this combination of 1366 and Hunt Technologies. What was the, uh, how did that conversation begin and what is the outcome? So, you know, as you alluded to at the beginning of the conversation, engineers really do dream of higher efficiencies and uh, we have, we have been dreaming about that for a long, long time. I've been personally been passionate about Tandem for, uh, for, for, for many years. Uh, we started seriously working on that a couple of years ago. And, uh, and, and the thing in the Tandem module what people need to realize is that you're, you're working with two uh, semiconductors working in Tandem. And the top layer processes the high energy photons. The bottom layer processes the lower energy photons, meaning the infrared. About half the energy we get from the sun comes to us as infrared. And uh, those infrared photons is, the, you know, is one of the reasons that the sun feels so nice and warm. And, and so uh, silicon, absolutely perfect for processing the infrared. The top layer does the high energy photons. The way the physics work out is that the bottom layer captures a third of the energy. And so one of the first things you need to solve when you want to do a commercially viable tandem is you got to have a very cost-effective bottom layer because you, know, you still carry the full cost of the silicon wafer on the bottom, but now the silicon is only used to generate a third of the energy. And so it becomes a very cost-sensitive proposition. And so we we spent a serious amount of time and effort developing what's called the direct wafer process to make that bottom layer really cost effective. And then uh, you, need a cost, you need a high band gap material on top. There are several uh, different materials that can deliver a high band gap. And, uh, uh, and, and one of them is uh, perovskites. 
And so we, uh, we were interested in proskites and we actually systematically talked to all the proskite efforts in, uh, in Europe and in North America and uh, evaluated all of them. Uh, I was most impressed with the work in Dallas. I mean, absolutely fundamental, honest work, you know, focused on the, the most difficult parts, uh, you know, a data-driven professional outfit and, uh, and, and some excellent results. And so the more I learned, the more enthusiastic I became. And then I was lucky and I had a chance to, to meet with uh, the senior leadership team at, uh, at Hunt. And, uh, and I proposed that we would combine efforts uh, to bring Tandem to market. And they, uh, they signed up and said, you know, that seems like a really worthwhile goal. Let's, let's do that. And, uh, and then uh, we, uh, we were... Uh, we were even more lucky in the sense that uh, you know several other shareholders also backed this uh, this merger, and uh, all of this was consummated a few weeks ago. So Cubic is very new. We're a brand new outfit, new logo, new new combination. So the 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 curfless technology that uh, 1366 has been developing for a number of years. Um, it really hasn't hit the market yet. I know I've read about, you know, some very big groups you've partnered with to help develop it. Um, is like, first off, might there be a product, a pure silicon 1366 based technology product that hits the market? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and that, uh, that could, uh, could happen very quickly. I, uh, you know, the, it, that particular product would be ideal for a market that's very cost sensitive. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, places where the cost of installation is relatively low and, uh, and the cost of the panel is, is very important uh, is then an ideal match for uh, the direct wafer solution that we, uh, we have invented. What is that circumstance, do you think? Huh? What, what environment is that? I'm just curious, what, what, what market do you see for Kerfless? Uh, well, all the utility markets in, in, in uh, places where the cost of insulation is relatively low. And so that, uh, that would be uh, most of the Middle East, uh, would be India, would be Africa. Uh, so, you know, whenever the cost of the insulation is low, you know, the, the price of the module becomes a dominant consideration. And, you know, because our wafer cost is more cost effective, it, uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's the better solution. The other thing that is important perhaps to some people is that we use a lot less energy to produce the wafer. I mean, for one, we use all of the silicon. There's a lot of emb embodied, embedded energy in the silicon. And, and then, you know, in the process of making the wafer, we also use half the electricity. And so our wafers have the lowest carbon content uh, of any other, of any product in the market. And so that, uh, that could also be a, a reason that people are interested in this. <clears throat> the process for making the curveless, for making the direct, is it similar-ish? Is it complementary to how the perovskite might be made. I hear much about the quick printing, the deposition, vapors, all those things are words that I know about, but I'm, you know, I don't make panels, I sell panels, but is this a, are there other layers of logic that drove the combination of your technology and hypothetically this one in the manufacturing line process? Yeah, no, both, uh, both efforts independently had a real focus on cost-effective manufacturing. And, uh, and, and so that, uh, that is very much part of our DNA, uh, both in, in Dallas and in, uh, in here in, in Boston. And so, uh, uh, that, yeah, you're right in pointing out that synergy. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in our case, uh, one of the key things we do is we, collapse four different manufacturing steps into one, make, and we make the wafer directly from the melt without any ingot step or without any sawing. And, and we end up using close to 100% of the silicon, whereas the traditional process uh, wastes uh, a significant chunk of the silicon, anywhere from 40 to 50%, and, uh, and uses a lot more energy in the production of the wafer. 
let's let's drill down a little bit on that because I think this is a really important point. And I'm I'm looking at the ultra low carbon solar alliance website where you are a proud member of a very select group of solar panel and silicon manufacturers across the globe. Uh, companies like Meyer Berger and Q cells and REC. And you know, we have to walk the talk in the solar industry, right? We have to reduce our carbon footprint and we have to make products that are truly sustainable, uh, not only cleaning the grid, but cleaning the manufacturing process at the same time, so to speak. But um, when, you, when you talk about the delta between curfless and traditional, where you have an ingot and then you're sawing the ingot and then you have waste dust, what is the input? Let's walk through the manufacturing process a little bit in this tandem technology. Can you do that? Sure. So uh, first thing we do is uh, we make the wafer directly from the melt. So if I compare and contrast that to the traditional process, the traditional process, you, uh, you melt a big vat of silicon, you then create a massive ingot, you then take a diamond saw, cut that into big bricks, and then you move the bricks into a wire saw and you slice the uh, bricks into thin wafers. So there's a lot of cutting and, and a lot of like melting and, and, and these furnaces stay hot for a long time and they're massive and they have lot, lots of heat loss. If in our furnace, it's much more compact, much smaller footprint, silicon goes in on one side, wafers come out the other. Much more streamlined and uh, we, don't, we, we don't do any of the ingot blocking and, uh, and, and, wafer, and the wafer slicing processes. We just, we simply produce the wafer similar to the way float glass is made. You just, you know, you take the top of the melt, solidify it, pull out the wafer. And then uh, if you then make a tandem, um, I am personally in favor of uh, what's called a, a four terminal tandem solution. And uh, then what you do is you assemble the cells very similar the way cells are assembled in a regular module, like, like the one behind me. And, uh, and on the glass, you deposit the, uh, the perovskite stack. And, uh, and now you have uh, the, the, the perovskite on the top. And you wire that separately from uh, from the silicon on the bottom, and that gives you all sorts of freedom as you design the module. And uh, and you you put the two layers together, you properly package it with uh, with uh, either a back sheet or glass at the bottom, and then you have a functioning uh, solar panel. So you don't sense? actually lay the second layer of perovskite on the solar cell. You put it in the glass. That's correct. That's correct. Very similar to uh, the way other thin film uh, modules are manufactured today. And there's and there's kind of a parallel universe evolving now, where perovskites will also be used in BIPV. Am I am I am I right about that, or am I dreaming? It could be. Uh, that's not an area where we are active. So, uh, it, but uh, it's absolutely possible for. Uh, uh, for this to uh, to be deposited on a whole whole range of substrates, the the nice thing about glass packaging things in glass is that you really give it excellent environmental protection, and it's easier to hit the 20, 30 year lifespan that is required if you uh, if you package things in glass. That's less easy when you uh, package that when you try to deposit it on flexible substrates and such. Have you guys put together, sorry, Tim, I'm going to jump. Have you guys put together a module, a, a thing that we can touch, a thing that we can smell yet? I mean, I'm, I'm itchy. You know, I, I cover, every, I see every announcement with perovskites and I read the first paragraph. And when I see that it's somebody who worked on a single molecule in a university, I'm like, okay, that's cool. But it takes a while to go from smart people in universities to a product that can be sold. And so, um, you know, recently you spoke with PV Magazine and you 
you suggested there's going to be a manufacturer who's going to get two gigs of product in the world, maybe by the end of next year. I, so I, yeah, no, I absolutely believe that. I believe that next year you will see the first tandem sales and, uh, and, and, you know, those will probably get delivered the, the, the year, the following year. But uh, I, I think tandem, tandem is much closer than people think. And, uh, and so uh, this coming, you know, the following year, uh, meaning uh, 2022, we will see the first tandem panels being sold. And uh, uh, our own uh, production is a little bit, uh, little, takes a little bit longer. Uh, we do believe that we have, uh, for fundamental reasons, uh, you know, a, a absolute world-class product, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll still need a couple of years to put that all together. Today, we are working on substrates that are uh, 150 millimeter in size. And so, uh, and so, you know, the modules that we are put to, together are 150 millimeters. That's clearly not yet commercial, but it's, it's a long way from the sort of one molecule lab uh, situation that you described accurately, by the way, because most people, uh, when they're reporting cross cut results, are talking about very tiny samples. And so uh, doing everything at uh, 150 millimeters as we are currently doing really means that we are in many ways leading the effort. That's, and that's just short of a, well, I mean, 150 was about the size of a lot of standard solar cells. I mean, very recently uh, it got a little bigger, but whatever, yeah. that's a, just to let the listeners know, 150 is borderline standard cell. For you guys, is it gonna be your standard-ish size product at this moment? No, no, the, the goal is very much to do what I described, which is deposit the perovskites on, a, on the glass side of a module and, uh, and take a full-size module and, uh, and then do the deposition of uh, the perovskites. And that's, that is a doable engineering solution. I mean, one of the reasons I feel relatively confident about transitioning that is that there are other pieces of glass that are uh, that are have small uh, layers de deposited on them all the time. Uh, notably, the television screens that we watch all the time, and uh, and so the the deposition techniques that are used in uh, uh, tele television manufacturing uh, are very similar to uh, what uh, we are currently working with on the uh, 150 millimeter. So the sense that that will scale. Uh, is uh, I mean I feel that's a is a low I mean certainly proof of concept has already be is already there in the display industry, and so uh, I I'm confident that we're going to get that done. And if but you know these things idea. these things take time. You know there needs to be a lot of engineering work. There needs to be a fair number of iterations. Everything has to be optimized, and uh, and so uh, that's why I'm quoting the uh, the three to four years to market. And if you had to guess, Frank, what what kind of wattage modules are we talking about? So I, uh, uh, I, I, we will initially come to market with a product that is probably around twenty five percent efficient, and uh, and then steadily increase that to the about thirty percent module efficiency that uh, is the entitlement of tandem. Now. You know, there's a, people bat around a lot of different efficiency numbers, right? There is the record cells in the lab, there is uh, cell efficiency, but the thing that matters is module efficiency. And today, uh, the most modules that are being sold have an efficiency of 20%. Uh, it is possible with single junction to get as high as 22, 23, possibly 24, but that would absolutely, at that point, you absolutely hit the limit. And so uh, when, uh, when Tandem gets introduced at 25, it will be the highest efficiency model uh, module on the planet. And uh, we're, uh, we're reasonably uh, confident that we can pull all of that up. And, uh, and that will just be the beginning. Because uh, if you look at the entitlement of Tandem, the Shockley Quasar limit for Tandem is 45% uh, efficiency, of course. The Shockley Quasar limit is what's theoretically possible. That's not possible in practice, but the idea that you can get above thirty percent is absolutely doable, and uh, and that's why tandem is so exciting. You know, once we're on that roadmap, it will get better every year, 
And ultimately, we're going to deliver panels that produce much more power than anything else we have today. And that's important because, you know, energy yield per acre is ultimately what it is all about. But so in a standard format, you know, of course, the formats are dynamic now. We're getting into larger yeah. format modules. And I predict that we will be seeing four by eight foot modules in, in a year or two. Um, but but let's face it, the standard size of modules is now 450 plus and reaching into the 500 watts. Uh, you know, Trina is releasing 550 watt modules this year in the United States. What, how does 30%, if you're able to achieve that, I mean, that's awesome. And I get excited about it. And John is jumping up and down for joy when he hears that number. But let's, let's also be realistic that solar installers aren't thinking about efficiency so much as they're thinking about wattage. Right. Well, for the, I just did a quick calculation. Uh, if you assume that it's a four by eight panel, and then uh, you assume 25% efficiency, then you're looking at a panel that's 720 watts. And so that hopefully that's something that would excite you. And that's just a start because then, you know, power, power will continue to increase rapidly in the following years. That's a big panel, four, four by eight. I, I do smaller projects than Tim. Tim does these big ground mounts. I do rooftops where people have to carry stuff and we use a six by three, but 720, that sounds cool. Trina does have a vertex module coming out next year at 670 but it's not going to be anywhere near those levels of efficiencies. It probably won't be a full four by eight, but 720 watt panel. That means someday somebody's going to get to say a thousand watt panel and you know, That's then we'll get to have some fun. That is right. You're absolutely right about that. So you announced a potential facility or a facility, a two gigawatt facility that you guys are developing, building, going to come to market with in India. Um, they have some great incentives for new manufacturers there. Um, obviously, you guys fit in perfectly well because India wants to incentivize not just module assembly, not cell making, but wafer and polysilicon. So hypothetically, with your machine, it seems like you should be able to grab all levels of that incentive and build a cost-effective product in a market that's very cost-sensitive. India has... I think the cheapest solar installation cost globally um, is, you know, how's, well, first off, how's it make you feel that you got a two gig factory potentially coming? I mean, is that a little stressful? <laughs> you know, to me, that's very exciting. I, uh, you know, now in full disclosure, you know, it's not so easy to get these things off the ground. And uh, the only way we will proceed in India is if we sign a strong partnership. And currently, these discussions are ongoing, but uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to pull all of that off and, and we will be able to execute on that. I think it is vital uh, that the world builds a uh, solar industry in India for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, it's a billion people that really need a lot of energy. Um, if they don't have renewable energy, they're going to burn domestic coal. And... Uh, you know, it's actually, there is actually sort of a really bad scenario possible where the West invests in all sorts of renewable energy and then all of that gets completely negated by the growth of the economy in India burning coal. And so that's not an outcome that is good for anybody. And so India should, instead of using last century's technologies, they should transition to the 21st century technologies and... Uh, and, and power their economy and power their growth with renewable energy. The only way that's going to happen is if they have a stake in that uh, new economy. And so the way to give India a stake is to allow them to develop their own renewable energy economy. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very heartened to see that uh, the Modi government is truly trying to do that. And so you know, being part of that is really exciting. And uh, I, I very much hope that we'll uh, be able to, uh, to execute our plans there. Um, I, I think there is a future where India would uh, manufacture a lot of solar panels very cost effectively, not only for domestic use, but also be able to export. And now you really are 
moving towards solving global warming. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I'd like to help that future happen. Um, by the way, uh, I, you know, if you sort of think of global dynamics there, it would make a lot of sense if, uh, if India would use American silicon to, uh, to power their uh, domestic uh, renewable energy uh, uh, manufacturing. You know, John, you and I were talking in the pre-show about the cost of solar, and, and that is one of the value propositions of Cubic PV, that you're going to make solar more affordable. Um, can we talk about the cost of solar and the future that Cubic is creating? Yeah, I, I believe that uh, we can get the... Uh, so today, I mean, prices vary, right? And, and, and you, you do see headline prices of two cents per kilowatt hours in certain special situations, notably parks in the Middle East and stuff. But truth of the matter is that most, uh, uh, most solar parks are still producing power somewhere in the neighborhood of five cents per kilowatt hour. And, and you, you all know more about this than I do, so you should speak up. But it depends, of course, it always depends on your local installation. And you know, a solar park in New York is going to be very different than a solar power in Texas, even if it's the same panel, because Texas just simply has more sun. I think at the end of it, if we, if we make all of these new technologies work, if we increase the efficiency, if we, if we move to technologies like direct wafer, then solar parks that produce power at one and a half, two cents per kilowatt hour become possible. And that's exciting because at that price, you can have very cost-effective uh, green hydrogen. And, 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 and the moment you have green hydrogen, then you've solved the entire climate problem. And so the uh, getting solar down to that next level of cost is actually very important to solve the entire puzzle. And, uh, and it's fun to be working on that. And yes, it's stressful to answer your early question. It is, uh, you know, it's, uh, these things are not, not that easy. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of uh, patience to move through long conversations and long documents that have many, many connections. Uh, trust me, we, I mean, Tim sells ground mount projects. We have to deal with the landowner, then the investor, then the utility, then the zoning. I'm sure that there's many, many layers going with constructing a new building as well so uh cool and, and what sort of what sort of electricity costs do you realize now in in uh, in, in these uh, larger solar parks that you're building uh i mean for our projects we're building in uh, upstate new york and we're doing five six megawatts for our biggest my biggest projects and we're we probably could generate and this is with incentives depreciation 30 percent tax credit we probably could generate in the five to seven cent range. Oh, yeah. um, you know, we have that's you know that's sunlight we have. Those are the installation costs we have. You know, right now with hardware cost up, we're probably closer to the seven cents, six cents yeah. than five cents. Uh, in India, though, they have the cheapest non-incentivized solar, I guess, and that's in the. Well, they had a couple of deals touch right at two cents per kilowatt hour, I think. Maybe 3.2 cents and it was two rupees or, I'm not so great at my conversions there, but uh, you know they have good pricing there. Uh, the cheapest globally, I don't think that these prices count though. If I, you know, Jenny Chase at Bloomberg, she tells me uh, the headline number means Jack in the Middle East because you know, land is free interconnection is free. She once told me that for one big project, the installation company was given free install labor for the first year. I was like, yeah. oh, I would love, I'd love a free year of labor. I mean, how do I get on that? Yeah, please give me a call. Tim, does your crew offer free labor ever? <laughs> I, I, I dream of free labor, um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But no, uh, we, we try to pay a living wage. And, and so that comes, at, that comes at a price. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I have to hearken, though, back to, to this whole two gigawatt plant in India. What exactly is the is the business model, Frank? Are you going to be making the machine that makes the machine or how, how do how do we tie the U.S. economy 
to this factory in India? So what we would like to do is uh, is is build uh, the uh, direct wafer furnaces in the U.S. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of machines that go into a wafer and cell factory. Uh, we definitely uh, will uh, both operate and provide the technical expertise for the wafer and cell plant, and uh, and and so the the tie. Uh, the, the tie that could work, uh, but you know, this, this is sort of like being hopeful and, and speculative a little bit, but the tie that could work is that the U.S. could export the equipment, could export the silicon that is, that go, that's used in the factory, and that India produces the panels uh, primarily for uh, domestic use and perhaps uh, also for some export. And uh, that way, both places and both economies would uh, would really benefit, and uh, um, I think you know something like that would be good for the world. You know, I I trade is good, right? I mean, it does increase well, it does increase increase wealth as long as it's fair. And uh, you know, we I think with India we have a real shot at setting up a fair win-win combination where we do certain things that we are good at and they do certain things that uh, that they are good at labor of course is much cheaper in india i think we have better technology and uh, because we have more reliable power uh, we're all and, and 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 better technology the us is also significantly more competitive when it comes to the production of silicon At some point in recent years, you were talking about potentially having a facility in upstate New York. Um, you know, they have cheap electricity up there and it's clean. Uh, lots of hydro up there. Are there. Are there any official plans? I mean, you do also have the facility located outside of Boston. Um, are there any hard plans where there might be a facility or is that going to, you'll take your patience as you figure out how you make it like, How's that look? Well, you're right about the power, right? And uh, and and the other thing about the U.S. is that uh, labor is more expensive here, but the American uh, worker is also far more productive than any other worker on the planet. And so uh, productivity is high here. Uh, the uh, the cost of power is is attractive. Um, and there seems to be a renewed interest in, in perhaps doing some solar manufacturing in the US. There's certainly a lot of encouraging, encouraging uh, news items, encouraging sound bites that are coming out of Washington today. Um, at the moment, there is the comprehensive policy that's needed to make this possible is not there. And so um, it, it just simply not viable to build a factory in the US in the, under the current set of rules. But the rules are changing and the rules are changing perhaps in our favor. And so uh, the moment that it becomes viable to do something in the US, we are very eager to do that. I can tell you that uh, all of our shareholders uh, would, are interested in pursuing that. I know I have an accent, but I am a proud American and uh, and, and, and proudly hold my, uh, my blue passport, uh, with something that is very dear to me. And uh, yeah, I, clearly a US factory would, uh, would also be a dream come true. And, 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 and that's where tandem might be helpful, right? Because when you bring tandem to market, we're gonna have such a technology advantage that uh, it might be possible to do something with that in, uh, in the US market. I think you've touched on something that keeps us all up at night, and that is the role of government in the energy transition and the opportunity that is just slapping us upside the head on a daily basis. There's a huge transfer of wealth opportunity that, you know, the, the energy transition is going to help the U.S. and the global economy grow while also stopping the uh, just a torrent, right, of climate chaos that is now confronting humanity. So can you, can you speak a little more, though, to that? If you were president of the United States, how do you incentivize American manufacturing? Because I firmly believe that that is 
uh, the way forward. I'm not opposed to doing manufacturing overseas, and I work in an industry which is truly global, and I recognize that. But I also want to create high-wage jobs here in the U.S. So, I mean, key there is that it needs to be it needs to be fair trade, right? I, uh, I, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, the. Uh, the, the production facilities in China uh, end up with a much lower cost because they're simply structured along different lines than uh, production facilities are structured here. Uh, you know, the, it's a different set of rules. Uh, the, uh, the state-sponsored capitalism that China uh, practices is, uh, is just simply different from uh, the economic rules that we work by. And so you get an outcome that is uh, not entirely level. And, uh, and that leads to these sort of miss situations where the cost is much lower when it comes from China because you know, their land was for free, uh, their building was for free, uh, their, uh, you know, their, the set of rules under which they worked under were much more lax and, and led to lower cost. Uh, you know, they, uh, they don't try as hard to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that they don't do environmental damage, etc. And so, uh, and so now you have a much lower cost because of some fundamentally different ways of doing the accounting. And then if you try to match that with uh, an American economy where, you know, you do have to pay for your land, you do have to pay a living wage, you do have to meet all the environmental rules then you know, there is no way that that works. So somehow or another, uh, if you want that to be in balance, you, uh, you need to create a set of rules that, uh, that, that account for that difference. And uh, I'm not a politician. Uh, I will never be president of the United States. And I certainly do not believe that I have all of the answers there. But uh, uh, the fact that you have to make sure that these things are properly accounted for and that you get a level playing field if you want to give American manufacturing a chance, that seems pretty obvious to me. Are you following the, I'm sure you're following, sorry, foolish question. I'm sure you're following the uh, coming reconciliation bill. Do you have any insight uh, on the Ossoff, uh, Congressman or Senator Ossoff manufacturing incentives and whether they're, how they're being received by politicians elsewhere? Well, exactly the dynamics there, I don't understand, but I do, I am familiar with the efforts of uh, Ossoff and, 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 you know, that is exactly the sort of thing we need. And so uh, if that's successful, that will be a big step in the right direction. Uh, we, uh, you know, we need, uh, you know, we need better technology, which we have in this country. And then uh, what would be particularly helpful is if uh, the US government can be sort of a first customer of choice uh, to really pull things through. And uh, if you look at many of our industrial successes, that's always been the case, right? Uh, you know, jet engines came to market because the US government was the first customer. Before jet engines, uh, people, few people realized, but the entire uh, sort of planes and, and uh, the aircraft industry was enabled because uh, the U.S. Postal Service decided to start doing airmail. And, and so, you know, the, the, that, that first customer uh, ability that the U.S. government has to pull through new technology is, uh, has often been instrumental. All right. That was true for semiconductor chips. You know, first semiconductor chips were for you, you, you was a U.S. government uh, purchase. And so uh, we all benefit when uh, the government is the first customer, makes something a commercial reality, and then it becomes available to all of us. And uh, I think uh, as we try to establish a new industry here, it's exactly those sort of things that could be very helpful. Seems to me solar's come 360, right? You know, we invented it here at Bell Labs in 1954. Yeah. Then we were a little bit asleep at the wheel. The Japanese and Germans and now Chinese kicked our butts. 
And now it's time for the U.S. to rise again and become a global leader in solar technology and manufacturer in manufacturing. Frank, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like our listeners to know? You know, I, I genuinely believe that tandem is the future. And uh, the importance of more efficient solar panels cannot be uh, overstated. Uh, that is absolutely essential to continue to make things better for all of us. And as long as that, uh, that is clear to the audience, I think we have uh, covered what we wanted to cover. John, I agree, by the way. I was about to tell you, I agree that tandem is it. Uh, you know, the, it, it's coming. We're going to keep getting better. Our machines are going to get better. Somebody's going to plop down that $100 million for a facility and figure out how to make a technique faster. It's going to propagate. Uh, you know, we have NREL who made a chip that had a 47.5% efficiency, and they think it could touch 50 and, you know, that's not a normal chip. It needs extra sunlight. It's got six layers. But the basic chip was 39%, 37%. It's coming. Um, you know, maybe it'll be that our space, what we're doing in space right now, trying to scale up space-based solar with the most recent solar panels we saw go to the International Space Station. They're trying to make it into a rolling, regular, ongoing product. You know, every single solar panel that goes to space right now is probably made by three people by hand in a lab with cool gear. That's not global scale volume. It's awesome for the International Space Station, you know, having custom things. But I think that uh, I think that tandem's coming. Um, no questions asked. You're going to hear me keep talking about it. You'll keep me. Well, you know, my science fiction Friday will have lots of tandem in it. That's great. Wonderful. Well, how can our listeners reach you, Frank? Oh, it's easy. Uh, just go to the Cubic PV website, and uh, there is a uh, place to, uh, uh, to, to reach us by email, or uh, our phone number should be there as well. Wonderful. Yep. The URL is cubicpv.com, and you'll see right there the story about 1366 technologies merging with Hunt Perovskites. Thank you so much for being here, Frank. Uh, John, how can our listeners reach you? Uh, they can scream out loud, commercial solar guy, or they could type it into Google. That works too. <laughs> Website, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever. Give us a call. We're around. We do stuff. <clears throat> I noticed some changes to your website. Can you say anything about that? Uh, <clears throat> it's a private information, not publicly out there. <laughs> We're... Uh, <laughs> So we're messing with the tabs on the top, trying to, you know, describe things going on a little more. For instance, we added the utility scale tab with some descriptions and some projects we're working on. And because uh, we got a sales guy who's working in New York and Pennsylvania, focusing on about 100, 200 megawatts. Hopefully within a month, we'll have an announcement of growth that's coming within our company. And then, of course, you know, my website's been terrible because... I'm good at the internet, but I never really shared any of the projects I do. So under the commercial tab, you'll start to see actual images of things we've built. Uh, so, you know, just trying to get it out there, trying to show off a little. What about your website, Tim? Very good. Very good. Well, you can reach me at cesnrg.com and then go to the podcast tab where you will find all of these wonderful interviews that we do here on the Clean Power Hour and the Solar Podcast please subscribe to the channel. It's just a matter of clicking that red button. Or if you're on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and please reach out to us, make comments, let us know what you think about tandem solar technology and the future of PV on earth. With that, I will say, let's grow solar in storage. I'm Tim Montague. Have a great day.